In this episode, you're going to learn what it's like to be part of a leading service design studio. So without any further ado, let the show begin. Hi, I'm Steven, and this is the Service Design Show. Hi, I'm Carrie, and this is the Service Design Show. Hi, I'm Tucker, and this is the Service Design Show. Hi, I'm Shreya, and this is the Service Design Show. Hi, my name is Mark Fontaine, and welcome back to the Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of service design. What are those hidden things that make a difference between success and failure? All to help you design great services that have a positive impact on people, business, and planet. This is a very special episode of the show because in this episode, you're going to get an exclusive inside look and hear the stories from the team at Harmonic Design. You'll hear how they communicate the value of service design, how they find new clients, what they see as the biggest misconception around service design, what they enjoy most about the work and 20 other things or so. The background to this episode is that the founder of Harmonic Design, Patrick Quaterbaum, appeared on the show in episode 115. And based on that initial conversation, a partnership grew between us. I can't express enough how grateful I am for the support that Harmonic Design has been giving to the Service Design Show and the Service Design Jobs platform. It's really partnerships like this that help me to keep on creating content for you. And I think this partnership also shows the commitment Harmonic Design has to keep on maturing the practice of service design and nurture this community. They really care. So in May 2022, Harmonic Design is celebrating its four year anniversary. And we thought that that would be a great opportunity to invite some people from the team onto the show and hear from them what it's like to be part of this leading service design studio. I reached out to the service design show community and asked, which questions do you have for the team? And I got a ton of replies. So thank you for that. The conversation you're about to hear is kind of an ask me anything format and the participants promised me upfront that they would give me the truth and nothing but the truth. I think that held up pretty well, but listen to the entire episode and judge for yourself. Hey, it's Mark from the future here. After recording the episode, we found out that Shreya's video feed wasn't as reliable as we hoped. Luckily, we managed to get all the audio in one piece and the conversation was so good that we decided to keep the episode as it is and not re-record it. I hope you're ready because we're going to dive into the conversation with Shreya, Steven, Kerry and Tucker. Here we go. Welcome to the show, everybody. Hey, Mark. Hey, Mark. Hey, Mark. Hello. Hello, Harmonic team. Uh, this is going to be an interesting episode. Uh, we haven't done something like this on the show before, so I'm really curious how this will work out. Really excited that you're here. Like I mentioned uh, in the introduction, we have a bunch of questions from the service design community about what's it, what it's like to be part of a team like Harmonic. Um, some are very interesting questions. Uh, some are provocative, some are uh, a little bit deep, and we'll try to cover them all. We have a few different formats in which we're going to do that uh, today. Um, I'll explain the formats uh, briefly. We're going to do a finish the sentence. We're going to do a lightning round and we have a deep dive uh, question. It's all going to play out in the coming minutes. Um, should be uh, fun, light hearted, uh, not too complex. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll get to learn you a little bit better and um, the harmonic team. But before we dive in, um, I know you uh, a little bit, but the people who are listening right now maybe have no clue. So I would love to go over and do a brief introduction uh, about who you are and what you do. And uh, Shreya, Shreya, sorry, maybe you could start. And the thing I'm curious about is what's your background and how long have you been part of harmonic? Well, thanks, Mark. Um, as you know, my name is Shreya. I am a service designer at Harmonic. We're based in Atlanta. And uh, I have a background in industrial design, and I soon kind of made my way into service design when I wanted to just learn more about, um, you know, one touch point in a service. 
Uh, and I've actually been with Harmonic a little over, th- I mean, almost three and a half years now. So it's been a fun and exciting journey so far. All right. Three and a half years, industrial design background. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Steven, what is your story? Well, I've, I've been with Harmonic since before the beginning for, for about five years. Um, so my background is a wild zigzagging through human-centered design fields. Started off originally in visual design, went into UX, done a lot of uh, design research in different media, including industrial design. Service design has, is the uh, latest stop. <laughs> I'm curious what's next, but uh, maybe we'll get into that later. Uh, thanks, Stephen. Uh, Gary, what about you? Well, like uh, Stephen, I have a background that kind of weaves in and out of uh, different disciplines. And I started, too, in visual design and uh, made my way through uh, different uh, marketing roles and business and uh, technology uh, but always had that kind of through line to design, uh, which brought me around 2009, 2010 to uh, service design. Uh, and in particular, I got really interested in organizational systems and how everything works together. So it was like it was a natural fit when I decided to jump in with service design fully. And how long have you been uh, with Harmonic? A uh, little bit over a year. Okay. Um, thanks. Uh, interesting backgrounds so far. Um, Tucker, you seem like uh, the one who's uh, probably uh, uh, sort of the most freshman at Harmonic, or are you? Definitely, yeah. I am just under a year. I think I'm at 10 months at Harmonic now. Um, so uh, I came from a background in health sciences. Uh, I actually studied rehabilitation science and assistive technology before I got into service design for my graduate degree. Um, so I come from more of a more of a product design background with some health sciences thrown in there, um, and then I switched over to to service design, and now I'm landed here at, at Harmonic. Awesome! Welcome in the community. Um, cool, <laughs> super diverse backgrounds. Um, and I think that also paints the picture of what service design is or should be or could be and uh, how service design teams look these days. So um, thank you for that. And let's jump into some of the questions from the community. And the first uh, format that we have is finish the sentence. Uh, so I'm going to pose a question uh, to you and uh, then we'll take turns and just answer this as briefly and as quickly as possible. And I'm going to look down on my phone because that's where I have the questions prepared. Um, and I'm going to start with you, Shreya, and then I'll uh, uh, mention who's next. So let's go. The first sentence that we have, and then I'm going to invite you to finish, is the way to effectively communicate the value of service design to new potential clients is? Shreya? So I think... Sorry. So I think the way to effectively communicate the value of service design to new clients is by doing and not talking. So in in my experience, even, you know, at Harmonic and outside of Harmonic, I think we've dealt through that situation a few times. And, um, you know, when you're constantly trying to show the value of service design to clients, big and small and across teams, uh, breaking silos. So I think it's more about um, you know striking the right balance between talking about it and showing them the value instead of just talking about the value that it could bring to them. Awesome. And uh, I'm going to move on to the next one. Otherwise, uh, your, your peers won't have anything else to add. Uh, thanks, Shreya. Steven, um, <laughs> how would you finish the sentence? Well, I think what Shreya said is 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 absolutely right. If I don't have the luxury of showing them and I just have to talk to them, I found that the easiest way to uh, convey the value is to point out examples where service design was not done on a service, help them understand that our job is to remove that kind of pain and frustration. And we have a lot of examples where service design wasn't done, or, or at least not consciously. Uh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gary, uh, your uh, turn. How would you finish the sentence? Well, very similarly, it's about doing, jumping in and doing. 
The other thing that I would actually say when I'm trying to communicate the value of service design is just intention, intention around designing for services. And um, it's often overlooked, you know, and services, in my opinion, will kind of design themselves. And so I kind of position it that way. And as far as, especially those that are new to it, kind of a the return on investment is that you're taking that intention around services and designing for, for that. And so you could be reducing pain, um, reducing costs, those type, types of things. Great. Thank you. Um, Docker, do you have anything to add to this? <laughs> yeah, all of those answers are great. I think the only um, extra thing I would add is it's just learning a little bit of their language and how they um, describe themselves and some of their processes. I think a large part of our work at Harmonic is just reorienting people to a service mindset and having this service orientation. So taking some time and understanding their language and how they talk about things so we can align and make sure we can make that transition into service design a little bit more seamless for them. Uh, great. And uh, if somebody is just listening right now, just make a summary of these four uh, answers and then you'll have your way to actually communicate the value of service design. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we have three more of these coming up later, uh, but now it's time to jump into the first lightning round. Uh, and I'm going to uh, start with uh, Shreya. I have five questions for you and I wanted to set a timer to 90 seconds. Let me uh, try to do that uh, right now because the goal here is to answer them as quickly as possible. Timer, 90 seconds. Uh, and we should hear a, a nice ring. One minute, 30 seconds. Um, Shreya, are you ready? Yes, I am. All right. Uh, clock is running. Now, first question is, if you could switch roles with one of the people at Harmonic for a day, who would it be? I think that I would switch roles with our CEO, Patrick, because I think he gets to see a lot of things that we don't get to see. Like he oversees all the projects. So it would be really interesting to switch roles with him. All right. Um, besides the possibility to work across multiple industries and companies, why should service designers work for an agency? I think apart from just uh, having a view over, um, you know, working at different agencies um, or industries, I think being in an agency really uh, helps you build a community of practice around and with the other practitioners that are working. So I think it has offered me a great opportunity to grow my practice. Great. Um What's the work you're most proud of? Uh, I think uh, coaching gives me a lot of joy. I think uh, Harmonic is moving uh, very fast and nicely towards a coaching model. So I think uh, any sort of coaching has given me joy in the past and will continue to do so in the future. Cool. Um, question number four. Do you get to access the stakeholders and customers you need? Absolutely. I think we've uh, been lucky in that sense, touch wood a little bit. Uh, we've been really lucky in getting hold of the stakeholders and customers that we have wanted to talk to. There are definitely, you know, adjustments that you have to make and work around some things. But for the most part, it has worked out well for us. Well, and that's the 90 seconds. Um, thank you, Shreya. You got to four out of five, which is a nice <laughs> score. Let's see how far your colleagues uh, get. So, um, Shreya, we're going to slow down the pace a little bit and we're going to move into a deep dive round. Um, you have a lifeline for the question that I'm going to pose. And if you want to involve some of your uh, co-workers uh, in this discussion, feel free to do so. But I'm going to start with you. And like I mentioned at the start, uh, these questions are coming from the Service Design Show community. People actually have asked these questions. So I'm just representing the voice uh, of the community here. Um, that's exciting. Let's do the deep dive. Um, so the question here is, what skills does someone need to demonstrate to work uh, as a service designer at a company agency like Harmonic? That's a very good question, Mark, um, actually, because we do, you know, kind of look at, we have a successful and done program as well, where we're constantly looking for, uh, you know, skills in, in a service design intern. So I would say, I think the biggest, the top thing for, for me or anyone who's looking um, to hire somebody is, is that passion for service design and that hunger to learn. 
Um, I think what makes Harmonic really unique is that everybody has found their journey into service design and everybody's really proud of it. They bring their own self and not try to just fit in to the culture that exists. So everyone has had a hand in building the culture at Harmonic. So, and, and I'm pretty sure that, you know, Stephen can talk a little bit more about that as well. Uh, but I think that is one of the biggest things that we are always there for each other. We help each other out. So, so that, you know, that growth to learn service design and grow your practice is one of the biggest skills that we look for. Uh, Stephen, uh, you were already invited in the conversation and I want to uh, sort of maybe uh, articulate one thing and that is uh, Shreya mentioned um, the passion for service design, passion for learning. I can imagine that somebody who wants to get into service design is really curious about how to demonstrate that. How do you show that? How do you see find that in people? A passion for 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 services. For service design, yeah, for services, maybe. Who? How do you demonstrate that? I have, I think it a it, it, couple of different angles. One of them is you know showing a certain connoisseurship of services, being able to talk about things that you've experienced uh you know services that you've received where you've really appreciated it and and seen the artistry um also think curiosity about services wondering what's going on under the hood when a service is is delivered to you uh being able to imagine what might be happening backstage uh to the front stage that you're experiencing i think that's a couple of things Mm. A, a connoisseur of services. I love that. That we need to we need to do something with that. That's that's just brilliant. Um, <laughs> uh, Shreya, anything to add to what Stephen just mentioned? Yeah, actually, I wanted to add another thing, and you know, just say that. Yeah, I really echo with what Stephen said. I think there is more to you know a person than just their portfolio and their work samples. And what we try to see is not how well polished the work is, but we try to see the thinking behind it. So we're trying to always evaluate if a person has a systems mindset and are they able to make those connections? Are they able to really zoom in and out? So, you know, back to my previous thing, we're, you know, we're, yes, we're looking for people who are passionate and want to learn from us, but we also want to help people who have, you know, already developed or started having an interest in a systems mindset. And and again, uh, how do you how do you see that? How do you recognize that in a person? I think it's more about not um, you know asking them to walk through each of the things that they have, but more like the why behind it. So every time they're walking through a project, it's about okay, why did you do this? What would you do differently? How does this fit into the bigger you know outcomes that you set out to achieve? Where did you, where do you think you were not able to achieve certain outcomes? So it's a little bit of probing, but you eventually get there. Like if I can throw in an example, I had this person, um, you know, who did not have a portfolio um, and they, instead of a portfolio, submitted a write-up of, you know, the things that they had done in their past projects. There were no visuals to it, but I could clearly see their thinking in the words that they wrote about how they approached the project and what their thinking was. So it can, mm. I think it can manifest in different forms. It doesn't always have to be visual, but I think being visual obviously gives you an edge, right? Well, you have a different means of communication and you can communicate right. things in a different way. But uh, I think it's important that you highlight this, that there might be an overemphasis on uh, visually appealing portfolios. Well, that that's not like nobody said that that's a requirement for any service design professional. Yes, exactly. Like I would say it's a nice to have. It's definitely a skill that has helped me in the long run. So I would definitely encourage everyone to explore it and really have that skill. But I wouldn't say it's a mandatory thing to be able to become a service designer. Yeah, cool. Um, Let's wrap it up at that. Uh, thank you for the deep dive, Shreya. Uh, we'll get back to you with some other questions in a, in a minute. Um, but now I want to move on to uh, our next finish the sentence uh, format, finish <laughs> the sentence chapter. And uh, Tucker, as you went last, I'm going to start with you. Otherwise, other, everybody will have uh, uh, taken your answer. So um, 
Finish this sentence. The biggest misconception about service design is... Ooh, that it's just a uh, way to inform UX design or product design. Um, I think it's actually a perspective shift and a mind sh mind mindset shift um, that we need to focus on more. Got it. Gary, what would you say? I would say sometimes I, th I think that there's a misconception that is kind of a uh, service design will solve that, right? And that it's like this oversimplification. And uh, to be involved in service design takes some real perseverance and dedication and commitment. And so, um, yeah, it's uh, it's it just it, it takes a lot of um, just dedication to the work overall. And I think that could be a surprise at times. Mm. Okay. Yeah, Stephen. Well, I know this misconception well because I had it for a long time before I figured this out, which is people confuse service design with omni-channel design. They forget the backstage and forget how important the designing the backstage is. So that I would I would say people think it's just simply applying human-centered design to to services and it's so much more complicated than that. We should communicate more about that in our own literature. Um, Shreya, now you're up last. How would you finish the sentence? Uh, I think, again, I think all great answers. I would say the biggest misconception is that service design can be only applied to services. I think that is one of the biggest misconceptions. Like, I've seen it applied to a lot of different, you know, you could apply it to a single touch point in a service as well and use the thinking and the mindset to be able to desi design better for that. So I feel like service design is more universal than we think it is. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for uh, this round. And we have two more. Uh, and But now uh, we're going to move into a lightning round. And the next uh, participant will be Steven. Steven, I've got five questions for you um, from the community and uh, added a few for myself here. Uh, are you ready? Uh, I don't. I'll know when you ask. <laughs> I'll know when. I, let, let's not forget to set the timer. Uh, Ninety seconds, starting now. Uh, Steven, describe harmonic in three words. A nerd's paradise. <laughs> Have you encountered questions from clients on measuring the return on investment uh, of service design, and if so, how did you reply? Oh no. <laughs> um, we have run into them and we usually try to get the measurements from them. What, what, we, what, what, what needle would you like to move? And then we start working in reference to that. Awesome. Um, what is it like to work with a famous best-selling author like Patrick? Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's just constant surprise. Uh, it's, you, you think that you know what he knows and then you hear him talk to someone else and realize you've barely seen the tip of the iceberg of that guy's knowledge. Mm. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, why do agencies still require people to do design challenges? Do you support that? And if so, why? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Well, in the hiring process, when you do a design challenge, when you ask somebody to do an assignment. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess desire for free work. <laughs> no, or, or, or just just wanting to, uh, to, to get a better sense of, of how an agency works rather than hearing how they talk about themselves. Yeah, cool. You got to four, which is apparently a good score. Uh, Thank you, Stephen. Uh, but now it's your opportunity to uh, do a deep dive with me. And um, the question I've got for you for the deep dive is, how do you get to know the full problem space when you're not based in-house? Well, the best you can. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to, to get inside it. Of course, one of them is asking them to uh, back up a truck full of documentation and we read it the best that we can. Um, a lot of times uh, it's it's difficult to digest before you actually get to have conversations with your clients. So stakeholder interviews are very helpful both as a um, both as information in its own right, but also kind of a language lesson learning how to uh, to to uh, to to get 
familiar with the way your, the, uh, the the client uh, speaks and uh, so that's that's a good starting point. But honestly, the development of the problem or understanding of the problem space happens throughout the entire project. We're we're learning all the way through, and hopefully, our client learns with us as we go. What what is the biggest um, challenge uh, not being in house? I guess when you're when you're in house, you are uh, steeped in 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 conversations all the time. You're hearing them go on in the halls. You're just you're immersed in it. You have a much better idea of the range of of knowledge available in the organization. So you have a better idea of knowing when your information is complete. You have a map of of what you don't know as well as what you do know. So. I think uh, I think you get a more holistic sense of of what's available and 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 what the state of knowledge is in your own organization. Gary, I'm I'm curious, like if you hear this, uh, sometimes knowing everything, uh, being on the inside, is also a burden uh, because it maybe limits the opportunities that you see, and you sort of uh, have a. Uh, it's harder to take on the beginner's mindset. Um, how how are you experiencing that? The being an in-house practice? Well, not being an in-house practice. So being uh, outside, like does which advantages uh -huh. uh, do you see? I would say the biggest one is that outside perspective, right? So sometimes when you're in an in-house in in-house practice, uh, it's harder to see when they're it's that much closer. And I know that might not make much sense, but from coming from the outside, we bring a fresh fresh mind, fresh eyes. And we really, I think one of the things that we really encourage in, in what is easy to happen when you're in-house is you really start to work from the inside. So you get a lot of, you know, we're developing new offerings and we believe there'll be, you know, customers will love it. But then you discover that it's very self-referential. The outside perspective, you know, we're able to facilitate the right conversations, right? So we can um, help them empathize and uncover what's really happening, both in the organization and for customers. Stephen, anything to add to that? I'd say a lot of the information that that we have is is almost meta information. Like we start learning who knows who knows what in the organization, rather than trying to be the ones who have it, we become the people who can be kind of the uh, the directory of who has it. So we, a lot of times the, what we, what we learn about organizations is who to pull into the collaboration that can help inform it. What is your strategy there? How do you actually uh, build that map and build those relationships? Who do you know who to approach, when to approach? Well, at first we're, asking other people and and uh, and just kind of giving them a clear sense of the, the kinds of uh, of people that we need to pull in um, for for various purposes you know we have a list of, of of types of people that we like to have in different types of of workshops but really over the course of the the project it's more just making friends with everyone and just getting a sense of what everyone knows and and who who uh who can come in and 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 help us out another thing that's important to know i think in addition to who knows what is also who in the organization is respected and has 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 a certain amount of political credibility because a lot of what we're doing is pulling people together to uh, to develop solutions, and you want to make sure that when people hear that someone was involved in shaping a solution, that that uh, adds credibility to that solution. So it's more likely to be taken up and really, uh, really used by the organization. It, it sounds. Uh like a very deliberate act to sort of uh, build a mental model or maybe even a physical model of these power dynamics, these uh, political dynamics. Uh, is that something that you actually communicate with a client upfront or is this something that you do just part of your day to day? It's part of our kickoff. We, we, a lot of times I will thank them for, uh, or, you know, the people that are in our kickoff for being there and explain to them that it's important that we have their involvement and have this particular 
mix of people in the room because we need to have their lens for understanding the problem. We need their particular form of ingenuity, you know, that, that where they'll see possibilities where no one else sees them, but also they're, they, they're representatives of their discipline. They are, in, in, a, in a sense, an endorsement of, of what we do. So we, we, we're pretty explicit about that, telling people that, you know, when service, service design problems involve a huge number of people, it requires a lot of different sources of faith. So we try to make the people involved in our projects aware of, of, of all the different kinds of things they're contributing to it. Yeah, and, and you do that by being very explicit about it right from the very get-go. Right from the start, yep. Yeah, yeah. So um, if we had to summarize this, how do you get to know the full problem space? What would you say? Uh, I would say it's, first of all, not believing that you are going to cram all the information inside your own cranium. You're going to try to, to create sort of a... Uh, distributed uh, information system and make sure that you have all the right people in the room who are able to contain this problem space. And the, the, the real task is to gain fluency so you can translate between the different uh, positions and, and get, get the uh, entire extended team to work like a big single brain. Awesome. A big single brain. A big single brain that has the full, oh, well, full. Uh, let's let's not get into what the full problem space is because that's probably never ending. Um, makes a lot of sense. Uh, thank you, Stephen, for going through this deep dive with me. All right, let's move over into the next uh, finish the sentence uh, question uh, we got from the community. And I'm going to start with you, Carrie, right now. Um, the question is... Our strategy to find new clients is oh, the first word that really comes to mind or two words, relationship and partnerships. So, you know, um, I think partially because of, you know, Patrick's reputation and, and the book, we certainly, um, you know, get people to, you know, organ different organizations connect with us. Um, but that, Initial these initial conversations are really open and honest, and we're really trying to understand where is it that or an organization might want to be. So I'd say the strategy really is is that relationship building from day one, you know, okay. and, and trying yeah. to understand what they're seeking to uh, solve or change. Well, um, well, note that one down, uh, Stephen. What do you have to add to this to this strategy? It's not really an addition. I would just say word of mouth. <laughs> I'll take that one. Uh, Shreya, what would you say? What is the strategy? I echo with, you know, what both of them said. I really resonate towards, uh, you know, building relationships right off the bat. So so I'm going to go with uh, just like plus one in carry on that. Fair enough. Uh, and Tucker, you're up last again. Um, what would you say? Uh, I might add this as a secondary, maybe not as a preliminary, but um, if it's an area of passion for any of our, our designers, um, I think Harmonic does something really unique of aligning our own personal uh, and professional passions with the type of work that we want to do. Um, so if there's an area that we see as um, really fruitful for a place of our designers to go in and, and do some of the work that they're passionate about, um, we'll make that happen as well. Like getting on podcasts. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you for this. We've got one uh, finish the sentence question round coming up uh, at the end. Uh, and now it's time to do a lightning round. And in this case, uh, I'm going to move to Gary. Five questions okay. for you. Let's see if you get to five. Uh, Let's do it. Um, 90 seconds. I'm going to restart the timer. Uh, there we go. It's running. So uh, the first question I've got for you, Carrie, is if you could change one thing about Harmonic, what would it be? Oh, good, good, good question. Um, if we could change one thing, I would just say, uh, and, and we're always constantly working on this, deepening our practice, growing our practice. Okay, okay. What's the ratio between projects that are implemented and projects that remain in the early stages? That really depends. Depends on the depth and length of the initiative. 
but we do take it all the way through and we have a number of projects that are in the implementation stage. Okay. What's the most challenging part about your work? Uh, <laughs> let's see, the most challenging part of, of my work, of our work as service designers, uh, I would say really, um, we're at a really interesting time where service design is still really new to a lot of organizations. So they're engaging in service design projects, uh, initiatives, uh, but they're not used to working maybe holistically or across functions. And so we are, um, you know, to some of the points made earlier, uh, constantly working to build relationships inside the uh, organization, uh, connect with stakeholders, work across um, uh, boundaries that maybe in the past might be really hard silos. And that was your 90 seconds. All yes, right, I, got I, I, I can second <laughs> that, that that's a definitely a hard, uh, hard part of our work. Um, the deep dive question is definitely related uh, to this and uh, let me uh, read it out loud. Um, so uh, this was a question again from the, from the community and um, the way it goes is, I would love to hear more about how you scope a project. Could you illustrate a specific example of a project you have done in the past? Uh, yeah, let me, let's just talk, talk with scope from the beginning. And I think we, talked about, mentioned this a little earlier, that those very, very early conversations are essential, right? So we're trying to really understand um, what is it when someone connects with us in organization, what is it that you're setting out to solve for? Where is it that you wanna be? Uh, and really get a, a gauge and an initial understanding on that, really understanding their readiness to actually do the work, right? Um, and uh, so I think it really is about tailoring um, to what an organization is seeking to solve for initially. That's really what it's about. So um, it's definitely, I think the one thing that Harmonic does really well is it's, there's no, it's not a cookie cutter approach, right? We really, really want to understand where is it that you want to be. And I can imagine that that's quite challenging then to sort of define the scope. Yes and no. I think that we're trying to also get people or organizations comfortable with, uh, you know, some some level of, you know, seek, here's what you're seeking to solve and the way there might change along the way. And we try to make it so that there could be an emergent practice around uh, what they're trying to achieve. So I think that um, uh, that that is the biggest uh, piece of it is just getting them a little bit more comfortable with, uh, you know, the scope might actually change, you know, depending on how we reframe the problem. And how do you do that? Because that sounds like magic. Uh, every client wants to know upfront, like, what will we get at the <laughs> end? Like, how long will it take? How much is it going to cost? Like, when will it be ready? How do you get them to embrace this level of uh, emergence and uncertainty? Yeah, I think that uh, that's a great question. Uh, you know, starting with a sketch and being very clear at the very beginning about what the process uh, might look like, right? And um, understanding what progress might look like towards the outcome. And again, constantly having those conversations to help people become comfortable with, you know, we could set different milestones, but also reinforcing um, the fact that it may change depending on what we uh, discover. I, I'm curious about the pushback you get, but maybe there's somebody on the team youth who might uh, comment on pushback. Who do you think could comment on pushback, Gary? Oh, <laughs> I think anyone on the team could probably <laughs> could probably take that. Uh, uh, um, Treya, would you like to comment on pushback? Uh, sure. Can you tell me specifically what, what you're looking well, for? Can you repeat the question yes. for me? Yeah, yeah. Well, so uh, if uh, if Gary mentions that getting clients comfortable with this way of working and setting milestones that might uh, change, I can imagine that you'll uh, not everybody will embrace this uh, right. open heartedly. Yeah, no, I think I think it's a part and parcel of every project. In my opinion, I think it comes with every project. I think it's important to really realize 
where there is a little bit of flexibility in what you're trying to achieve and where are some fixed goals. So I think I see it as here are things that we are setting out to achieve. We have to achieve these specific goals that we are, you know, for sure after and then leaving some sort of, you know, leeway or some sort of um, flexibility in terms of like where we go with the rest of them. I think it's also like a constant checking and rechecking of those milestones and and also readjusting them, in my opinion. So could you give an example, like what is the thing that you know that you're going to deliver upon? What are some of those fixed things uh, that you can give a, a level of comfort and sort of predictability uh, for clients who are seeking that? I think uh, a lot of the business outcomes kind of uh, align towards that when you're looking at journeys, if, you know, if the work is connected and if the work that you are delivering is kind of connected to the next piece of work that is already lined up, those are some non-negotiable things that you're definitely, you know, going after. But if there are things that are nice to have in a project, those could still be, you know, taken as, okay, it is going to be awesome if we achieve these. If not, let's find alternative ways to, you know, see or obtain value out of the engagement. Hmm. Uh, Gary, anything to add to what Shreya just said? Yeah, I, I definitely will kind of plus one that is, you know, again, identifying what are the, you know, there could de obviously be some definite goals that that an organization can can be going after maybe it is you know for example uh, they know that they have a high cost and a, a, there's high service recovery and and part of uh, the experience that their customers are having uh and perhaps one of the things they're really after is reducing the costs related to all the service recovery and so we could really pinpoint those things but at the at the same time you know, it is it is tricky and challenging because, you know, because we use a lot of generative research and we're really trying to unearth the real need and get at like, uh, what is it that we really, really have to address? There could be a, that could be packed with a lot of surprises. So from that and learning from that, um, sometimes we kind of reshape what those goals might end up looking like. What kind of clients uh, does it take? The, to do these kind of projects what kind of clients does it take to do these kind of projects that's that is a big question <laughs> i know so let I, me let me re yeah. sorry let me rephrase it yeah what is the first thing you look for in a client oh okay i love that question what is the first thing you look for in a client uh you know i think the thing that really stands out for me that is really really essential and important is um, this kind of uh, hunger to make things better, right? To improve an experience, to innovate a new service and how far an organization is willing to lean in, especially because this is the new, right? To the new. And it could be really, really uncomfortable. So looking for companies who are ready to just really step in and work side by side uh, I think is is huge. It's essential. It's really essential. Thanks. It makes a lot of sense, and it sounds mm -hmm. like uh, great clients who uh, <laughs> who have that attitude. Uh, yeah. Definitely worth the investment of spending the time to uh, to honing in on them. Uh, thank you for this deep dive, uh, Kerry. Um, we have uh, a finished sentence. Uh, question lined up for you and this is going to be sentence number four uh let me open it over here yes um <clears throat> and we already touched upon this a little bit but uh it's also different steven i'm going to start with you for this one um yes uh you can unmute there we go the most fun part about my work is uh the insights that come from research having those breakthroughs that that you could not have had if you hadn't had that group of people in the room talking to these these uh people involved in the service yeah awesome uh shreya what would you say i would say like you know collecting from a recent experience i think for stakeholders to be uh listening to the customer's voice i think though that is very rewarding for me thank you uh tucker what about you what is the most fun part about your work? Uh, 
I, I often see a direct translation of uh, the stuff I'm working on, the designs I'm working on, and uh, my own personal life. Uh, as a recent example, we just got off of a of a client and uh, working around behavioral science. And at the end of it, I am now reconsidering how much eat meat I eat and my environmental impact on most of my decisions that I do throughout the day. Um, so I think that's something that as, as designers, and especially as service designers, we often don't talk about the, the how it affects our own personal identities. And um, I see that every day in our work and reevaluate myself in a system. Um, definitely after a hard day of work. <laughs> mm, mm, yeah, yeah, it's just it's not just professional growth, but it's personal growth as well. Um, definitely. Cool. Uh, yeah. Um, Gary, uh, what about you? What is the most fun part about your work? Well, I'll definitely echo what, uh, well, what everyone shared, but what Tucker shared. I think that you start to uh, look at things a little bit different, or you kind of have this heightened awareness of uh, services when you're out in the world and how important they are. Uh, I would say uh, one of the real rewarding pieces of this work is when we're working with organizations and you have kind of, I don't know what I would call it, like a aha moment, right? And you're getting people to work together who may not have ever had the opportunity to work together. And they're starting to kind of orient themselves around potential and possibility of, you know, creating a new experience. And um, I think that that is really, really rewarding is to, mm. to hopefully, you know, people have um, uh, a better day at work because they're coming together to design for uh, a, a better experience. Beautiful. Um, thanks, uh, Gary, uh, for this. Um, this concludes uh, round number four of the finish the sentence. And uh, we've got a lightning round and a deep dive uh, left with uh, Tucker. Um, also, five questions lined up for you. Let me go to the uh, timer. Are you uh, ready, Tucker? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to try and hit all five. No one's done let's, it yet today. So. <laughs> yes, let's do it. So <laughs> question, no <laughs> question number one, who's your favorite coworker? Oh, boy, controversial. Um, my favorite coworker is uh, I've worked actually a lot with Steven, and we have a lot of like differences in the way we think, but he's also helped me um, explore service design in a really philosophical way. Um, and that has been really eye-opening to me. Steven, you're my favorite. Got it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Taco, what's the biggest failure you've made in a project? Oof, biggest failure. Um, I would say not, um, not considering some of uh, the other implications outside of the actual design that we're working on. Um, I am such a new designer and such a young designer in this field that sometimes I get caught up in um, the design components of our project and less so of maybe the business components. And that's just not where an area of strength I have right now. And I'm trying to practice that a little bit more. Um, but I would say, uh, yeah, that might be an area of, that I want to improve a little bit more in translating that over to our clients. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, quickly moving on. Why did you decide to apply at Harmonic? I ooh, I decided to apply about a year ago now to this day. Um, I am actually based in DC. I'm not based in Atlanta. And I came from some of the design consultancies around here. Um, had heard about Harmonic for a couple of years now and had a couple of colleagues. Shreya was actually someone I went to grad school with. So I had heard really great things. And um, luckily, the stars kind of aligned with timing um, that I could... Uh, take over a position here. Cool. You made it to three. Uh, oh. That's a lesson. <laughs> that's a lesson for the next Ask Me Anything uh, group that I'll be doing. Uh, let's see if we uh, can get to five. Uh, but Tucker, we have a deep dive left uh, for you, which you have some uh, more uh, time to answer. Um, <clears throat> yes, and this is a, a very interesting one. Uh, I would love to get your perspective on this one. So uh, sort of the... Uh, question or a comment is, companies are investing in in-house design teams. What is the future of agencies? Uh, will agencies uh, be still relevant in the future? Yeah. So I think um, as design matures in some of these organizations, um, they are starting to build these teams and realize it's probably a save in 
saving them a lot of more money to invest in these internal design teams. I think something that Harmonic does um, and helps us in the future is one of our core values is pushing pushing our practice, like Carrie said earlier. And I think something that I see as agencies evolve in the future and as service design matures in the U.S. is particularly, um, we are going to be uh, utilized more in pushing the practice and understanding how to take some of these high level complexities of service design theory and really push them um, with our clients. So I, I see us more maybe as uh, pushing the boundaries of service design in the future. And I think there's a lot of areas still open to explore in service design. And I think these agencies that are connected to a lot of different partners and clients um, have a really ripe territory of being able to pull from a lot of different industries and push practice in that way. Mm pushing the practice. Um, Steven, um, I sort of feel that you also have a perspective on this. Would you, what would you add? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I would build on what Tucker just said. Um, the, the, the good thing about being at an agency is you see a lot of different kinds of organizations with very different cultures and different ways of, of doing things. And you see a wide variety of problem types and so you end up becoming kind of a uh, encyclopedia of of approaches, and uh, and 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 you and you you have a lot to draw on. So one of the things I think people from agencies bring to to their to to other organizations like organizations that hire them is just a a, a breadth of experience. Um, Tucker, uh, any comments? On that. No, I think that's that's a really good way to summarize it. I think um, our skills are being able to translate what we're seeing in other um, other industries, other types of problems, and um, making those connections with our clients. So being able to have that bank of experience in our in our background is is going to be really helpful, and I think that will take us through the next couple of years, hopefully, of being. <laughs> profitable <laughs> so yeah <clears throat> maybe a related question to this so um if that's not the thing that in-house teams uh, are going to sort of take over anytime soon pushing the practice maybe to some sort of extent what do you feel is the thing that in-house uh service design teams would be able to take over yeah i think something that we've been talking about at harmonic recently is how to scale service design um, and that doesn't just mean scaling the services that they offer to larger and larger populations, but it really means like scaling that mindset, the service design perspective um, throughout the whole organization. And I think that's something that in-house designers, we can really lean on them. I don't see in agency designers and in-house designers as, as opposites. I think that they can leverage some of... Um, their skills of being in-house and having that expertise and being able to really scale that service design mentality throughout an organization in a way that we can't do when we're just seeing them a couple of hours during a week. Um, so I think we'll lean on, yeah. lean on them in the future. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, they're, they're there like five days a week, uh, nine hours a day, and uh, they have much more uh, influence potentially and much more stamina, <laughs> much more patience probably. <laughs> Uh, compared to to an agency uh, perspective, um, so uh, there's definitely a future for agencies. That's what I'm concluding from your answer. Is that correct? Yeah, maybe I'm just an optimist being so young, but I hope there's a future in agencies, <laughs> in in some way or or form. Um, okay, thanks. Uh, this actually concludes uh, the four deep dives that we had. Uh, while we were talking, I just actually came up with a fifth finish the sentence round sort of uh, as a bonus round. And uh, let's do uh, this really briefly. Um, so my question uh, uh, for you is um, which podcast or book would you recommend to any service design professional out there? And let's start with you, Shreya. Which book or podcast would you recommend? I mean, honestly, I think I would definitely recommend Patrick's book, but it goes without saying, because I think even when I hadn't joined Harmonic, it gave me a good practical way to apply service design. While I've seen a lot of other books are more around 
the theory as much as I, you know, I I want to learn about theory. Sometimes you really want to dig deep and really know about okay, but how do I do this? So I feel like that book does a good job at breaking that down. So till date, my favorite book has been that. But if I had to go, you know, just like recommend something else. I would say the experience centric organization has been a really good book for me recently. And what's the title of Patrick's book? Uh, Orchestrating experiences. Yes, we'll add a link to the show notes. Uh, thank you, Shreya. Uh, Stephen, what would you recommend? Well, I'll tell you the book I keep recommending to people on my teams, and it's not a service design book. It's a philosophy of design book, uh, Thomas Kuhn's Structure of Scientific Revolutions. People use the uh, the phrase um, paradigm shift a lot, and a lot of times people don't know where that came from. It came from that book. Part of the reason I recommend it so often is service design is itself a pretty serious paradigm shift, even within human-centered design, which is itself a paradigm shift. Um, but also a lot of times what we're trying to affect at organizations is itself a paradigm shift. We're trying to get them to think about the service they provide in a radically different way. And uh, Structure of Scientific Revolutions really shows how, how that process works. So uh, Structure that's the of Scientific Revolutions. Yeah, it's a classic. Awesome. Very good. Cl it's not on my bookshelf yet, but uh, it's definitely coming. Uh, thank you for the recommendation, Stephen. Carrie, what about you? Well, I will uh, kind of plus one what Shreya shared. I think the experience-centric experience organization is a really good book to dive into, uh, definitely. Uh, I think the um, other book that I would recommend is actually a um, book called Brave New Work, and they also have an associated podcast. Uh, I, I think that, you know, we sometimes talk about the boundaries of design and we have all these different disciplines. Uh, service design touches on so many things. And to do service design uh, is to be working on organizational effectiveness or organizational performance at the same time. So um, I like uh, Brave New Work because it kind of you know, brings in system thinking, kind of very practical around thinking about what kind of um, uh, experiments can you run and, and how you work together. Because so much of uh, designing for services is dependent on that. Thank you. Brave new work. Uh, we'll add a link to the show notes. Mm -hmm. uh, and finally, Tucker, what would you add to the list of recommendations? Yeah, uh, Stephen does a really great job because he sends me a lot of book rec recommendations, including scientific uh uh, gosh, I already forget the name of that the one. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the bookshelf back there. But the one that I keep coming back to, and since I've started with service design, is uh, the design philosophy reader. Um, I think this is a really good book. It is dense in some areas. Philosophy isn't always the easiest thing to read, but I think it helps us understand uh, some of the why behind uh, the designs that we we build and we implement and we create together with other people. And I think that's a really important question to understand um, as designers is what what is the philosophy behind design and why are we doing this certain things that we're doing? It? Is it innate? Is it something that's um, just meant for humans to do? So um, I think touching back on time to time, I wouldn't recommend reading through all this book at once and going out into the world and trying to uh, recap everything that you learned. But I think touching back to this book um, is really helpful as a designer. For uh, if somebody is listening to the podcast version of this uh, recording, yeah, uh, you showed the uh, cover yes. of the of the reader, and it's actually quite worn. So, uh, <laughs> which is a yes. good sign, I guess. Uh, yes. Perfect. Uh, those were some very useful recommendations, and I'll make sure to add everything in the show notes. I guess this wraps up our uh, Ask Me Anything sort of kind of uh, service design show episode. Uh, this was a first an experiment. I hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, I did for sure. Um, thank you for coming on. Thank you for sharing and giving us a little bit of an insight what it's like to be um, a service design professional at a leading service design agency in the States. Pretty cool to get that insight. I'm sure there's so much more to share, but... Uh, We'll keep that for a different moment. So uh, Shreya Tucker, uh, Stephen, Gary, thank you for coming on. I want to give a huge thanks to the Harmonic Design team for coming on to the show and sharing so openly with us. 
it's great to have them as a partner and see their commitment for helping to grow this community, not just in words, but also in actions. I'm always looking for more brave companies who actively want to support our field. If that sounds like you, let's have a chat about how we can partner. Send an email to mark at servicedesignshow.com and let's take it from there. Finally, if you want to know more about harmonic design or the people who appeared on this episode, check out the links in the show notes. My name is Mark Fontaine and I want to thank you for tuning in to the Service Design Show again. I'll catch you very soon in the next episode.